Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks. This is a series of how-to videos where we talk about the equipment that we install and maintain in the field onto the uh, codes and standards that apply to those jobs that we have to do. And we also talk about safety and the specific work practices that we need to know to keep ourselves safe out in the field. I'm Randy Barnett. I'm your facilitator for today's presentation. And this series of Tech Talk videos is brought to you by ECNM Magazine. That's ecmweb.com. So go to the upper left-hand corner on that website and click on that drop-down menu. And the very first item you'll see is premium content. And that'll give you access to tons of information, not only about the topic of transformers that we're going to talk about today, but to lots of other webinars, uh, Tech Talk videos, ECM Ask, and so on. So anyway, lots of free information that's available to you through that premium content access. Now, let's get started then with this Tech Talk on transformers. Transformers are found in Article 450 of the National Electrical Code. Unfortunately, the National Electrical Code, nor even really the, uh, the nameplate on the transformer, gives us all of the information that we need to know to install that transformer and meet the code requirements. So we want to talk a little bit about that today, as well as just kind of a general overview of some of the information that's in Article 450. First of all, if I go to Article 100, there's a definition for transformers. And we can go read it, but... If you read it, what you're going to find out really is it kind of tells you how a transformer works. It tells us that there's a coil of wire, and when I induce a voltage into this coil of wire, uh, I build up an electromagnetic field around that coil, don't I? And so we refer to that coil as the primary side or the primary coil. Then because of the elect electromagnetic field that's building up and collapsing, right, it builds up in one direction. The current flow stops, reverses, and goes in the opposite direction. So my magnetic field builds up in the opposite direction. And that's happening 60 times a second, isn't it? So 60 times a second, I induce a voltage in one direction into another coil of wire called a secondary coil. So the current flow uh, flows in the out of the secondary in one direction, then stops and goes back in the opposite direction 60 times a second. So that's how the transformer works, that principle of electromagnetic induction. And I realize you probably had that way back in, in basic electrical training. But anyway, uh, some of the keys to us to help us understand this transformer and how to install it is the turns ratio, for one thing, uh, certainly when it comes to maintaining the transformer, because I can short out just a few windings inside of a transformer. And so we can do something called a turns ratio test, a, a transformer turns ratio test or a TTR. And we can actually make sure that we have the proper turns ratio on the inside of that transformer. But when it comes to installation, usually we're going to probably install, I'm guessing most times certainly, is a step-down transformer. Meaning that, let's say, for example, if I had 10 turns of uh, windings on the primary side and only one turn on the secondary side, uh, if I applied voltage on the primary side, it would step it down in a 10 to 1 ratio. Now, the transformer that we're going to look at today we're going to apply 480 volts to the primary side. And because of that particular turns ratio, we're going to get 208 volts out on the secondary side. So we're going to be talking about three phase transformers, really, because that's, that's uh, primarily the transformer we're going to install out in our distribution systems, isn't it? Now, uh, larger transformers, power transformers that are oil cooled, those are covered in the National Electrical Code in Article 4. 450 under installation requirements in part two. And it depends on the type of uh, cooling liquid that you have on those liquid uh, cool transformers. And uh, you can have, for example, less flammable uh, liquid insulated transformers is covered in, in section 450.23. Non-flammable fluid insulated transformers are covered in dot 24 and uh, oil insulated are covered in dot 26 when they're installed indoors, and oil insulated outdoors are covered in 450.27. Uh, as far as overcurrent protection, so on, that remains the same on those transformers. What some of the differences that you'll see, for instance, it can kind of make sense. If, if I have a liquid filled transformer, there may be a requirement to put some kind of containment area underneath that transformer so that uh, if I do leak any liquid out, I'm able to catch that and not let it you know, go all over the ground and so forth. 
Now, overcurrent protection is covered in 450.3. And there are two tables for us on overcurrent protection of transformers. Uh, the uh, first table applies to transformers more than 1,000 volts. And then the second table applies to the transformers that we're going to install be 1,000 volts and less. And also, uh, we need to understand the scope of this article is it doesn't apply to all transformers. So if we take a look at the beginning of the article in 450.1, it lists eight different transformers that don't apply. Now, one uh, that we commonly see in our distribution systems is the current transformer. So we take the current transformer, put it around a conductor or a bus bar, and we're able to measure the amount of current flowing through that conductor. And we'll use that, you know, that current transformer will supply maybe an ammeter or a protective relay. Uh, also, other transformers that are not covered are some special purpose transformers like for x-ray machines. Also keep in mind that transformers that and when we buy a piece of equipment, say a machine, and it comes with a transformer mounted on the inside, that transformer is not covered by Article 450. In fact, neither is the wiring inside of that uh, um, piece of equipment covered by the National Electrical Code, unless we go in and modify that wiring and equipment on the inside, then the National Electrical Code come into play. So anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about overcurrent protection on transformers. And the tables are 450.3. And so what I want to do is let's put up on the screen um, a, a nameplate from a dry type transformer and go through the specific information that's required in 450.11, which is the marking requirements of the nameplate uh, labeling requirements for the for transformers then. So let's take a look at this dry type 75 kVA transformer nameplate. So there are eight pieces of information <clears throat> that are required to be on the nameplate of a uh, transformer. And so first of all, up here at the top, pretty obvious, we have the manufacturer's name, their name and logo, and so that name is required to be there. We need to do, know who, who made this transformer. In fact, it's really nice, it's not required, but they've got the catalog number there and so forth. So if we needed to, we could go back to that manufacturer and we could get a copy of the manual, OEM manual associated with this piece of equipment and you know we, and get more information or whatever it is we needed. Uh, also, we have to have the voltage on the transformer. Well, for one, it tells us it's a three-phase transformer, not required to be there. But that should be obvious to us as we look at the information down below. What is required, it says that the primary voltage has to be there. It's 480 volts applied to the primary windings. And those three windings, one for each phase, A, B, and C, they're connected in a delta configuration. The secondary side, that voltage is required to be there. And it tells us that those three phase windings are connected in a Y configuration. So you can see the Y. 208Y slash 120. That means we have the 208 volts phase to phase uh, in the Y connection. And then from any phase conductor to ground or to what will be this neutral point on a Y connection, then we would read 120 volts. The frequency is required to be there. And so this is uh, 60 Hertz. So we want to make sure we install the transformer with the right frequency rating, don't we? The impedance of the transformer is there. This is its internal impedance, 4.56%. So what that is, is the, uh, and we know what resistance is. Resistance is the opposition to current flow in a DC circuit. And everything has some resistance to it. So the windings themselves have some resistance. But because of the effects of the electromagnetic induction going on inside the transformer, we have additional opposition to current flow. And that's called inductive reactance. So if we were to go through the formula for the inductive reactance and the resistance, we would get the impedance value. So impedance is the opposition to current flow in an AC circuit. So for this particular transformer, the internal impedance is 4.56% at full load. Now, we're going to need that number a little bit later on, as we're going to see. Also down below, two other bits of information that I need to know is uh, any ventilation requirements, that's required to be on there for the National Electrical Code 450.11. And it says ventilation opening shall be six inches minimum from walls or other obstructions. 
So six inches minimum from walls or other obstructions. And then finally, the last bit of information that we're required to have on our nameplate, according to 450.11, is the class of insulation. And that's down here at the bottom where it says class 220 insulation system. That's the maximum insulation or the maximum temperature that we can allow inside of that transformer. And that's 220 degrees C, which is 428 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if I don't meet the uh, minimum insulation class, which is 150 degrees C, and depending on the size transformer, I may have to install some fire resistive barriers around my transformer. And probably don't want to do that if I don't have to, huh? So really, if I look on my uh, dry type transformers we installed in our distribution systems, you're going to find a class 220, most likely, insulation system. Now, some other information that's on our nameplate that not required to be there then, but it's certainly helpful to us. It gives us a continuous temperature rise or at continuous operation, a temperature rise of 150 degrees C. That's the average temperature rise to the windings inside the transformer when it operates at full load. That could be handy to know for maintenance purposes. Some of our transformers have sensors on the inside to tell us what the temperature is in those windings in. The frame size is uh, 19. 14B, uh, 75 kVA is required to be there, right? We had talked about it, but we didn't circle it. So the 75 kVA transformer, that's the volts times amps. Well, we're going to see a little bit more about that uh, 75 kVA rating here in just a minute. The weight is nice to know, so I'm not going to pick this 455 pound transformer up and set it between my two overcurrent protections pieces of equipment back here behind me, but we're going to talk about that. Then I have some information down here that's really pretty handy. Uh, it shows me the connections on the transformer and how to wire this transformer up. So if I take a look at this transformer nameplate on the far right, it shows me the primary side is a delta configuration, and the secondary side is the Y connection. So I get 208 volts on the secondary if I were to read, say, from X1 to X2. But if I read from X2 to X0, which is our neutral point, there's my 120 volts. Huh? So that brings in a whole uh, another system, really, doesn't it, when I go through a transformer? Because I'm going to have to ground the center of that Y connection in most cases. And we're going to call this a separately derived system. And uh, so that separately derived system, that's covered in 250.30. So Article 250 in Grounding and Bonding and Section.30 for separately derived systems. So you still have lots of grounding and bonding requirements on this transformer, but you really don't find them in Article 450. They're in Article 250 on grounding and bonding. <clears throat> now, we notice down here it shows the uh, primary side. So for the primary connections, I have H1, H2, and H3, don't I? And then on the secondary side, there's X1, X2, and X3. And then this is my XO, my neutral point over here on the far left. And it shows it is the neutral is bonded and connected to the earth and ground. Now notice along on the primary side, there are different taps that we can connect to and are labeled one through uh, eight. <clears throat> over on the left-hand side, we see a column that says volts and then it says taps. In the real world, We'd love to always get 480 volts, I suppose, into this transformer and get our 208 volts out on the secondary side. But the incoming voltage may not always be 480. Let's say that it is uh, uh, pretty close to, oh, I don't know, 456. So if we were at 456 incoming voltage and we still wanted to get that 208 volts out on the secondary, we can connect our primary connections to five on each one of those phases. So the number five tap on each one of those phases and that incoming 456 would then give me the 208 out on the secondary side. Now be aware some transformers, some of the larger power transformers uh, will have tap changers on them where we can go in and either manually or it may be an automatic uh, tap changer that can actually uh, change the tap settings under load. But uh, this particular transformer, of course, we 
you have to actually pull the front off, de-energize the transformer and change any tap setting. Right? So that's a pretty important little table for us when we go to connect the transformer up. Also something else that it doesn't mention in here, but that we would certainly wanna do when we connect a transformer into a system is, we always want to get a phase rotation meter and follow your safe work practices and check for proper phase rotation. Now, normally both on the incoming primary side and the secondary side, certainly once you connect this transformer up. If not, your three phase motors are gonna run backwards and you can have all sorts of problems in your distribution system. So if I were gonna take this transformer now and put it into my system, let's talk about our overcurrent protection that we're gonna need for this transformer. What we've got is a 75 kVA transformer and with a primary voltage of 480 and a secondary of 208. So the next thing let's do is let's talk about providing some overcurrent protection on both the primary and the secondary side of this transformer. Uh, and one of the things that I'm going to have to know when I go to table 450.3, actually, and remember there are two tables, the one we're going to be using is 450.3b for less than 1,000 volts. It requires me to uh, take a percentage of the full load rated current of the transformer, and that's how I'm going to size my overcurrent protection. So I need to know what the amperage rating is on this transformer. And guess what? We just went through and it's not on the nameplate. So out in the field, I need to be able to determine this. I'm gonna go ahead and put the formula for it up on the screen. And so here's our formula. To determine the full load current in a three-phase transformer, the I sub FLA, we're gonna take the KVA rating, which we know is 75 KVA times 1,000. And into that number, we're gonna divide the line to line voltage times 1.732. So we know on the primary side, we have 480 volts. So we could take 480 volts and multiply that times 1.732. The reason that we use 1.732, that's the square root of three. And as you recall, maybe from some of your basic electrical training, when we start working with three phase power and try and add voltage together, uh, we cannot do it directly. So we come up with that square root of three, 1.732 then. So we multiplied 480 times the square root of three and divided that into the 75 kVA times a thousand. And we've already done the math and here's your answer down here, 90 amps. So the primary side, the full load current on the primary side is 90 amps. Now I go to my table 450.3b. So if you've got your code book open, you can do that. In 450.3b, the very first column says primary and secondary protection. So we're gonna have both. And then the next column over is for primary protection. If my current, my rated current of my transformer is nine amps or more, well, certainly at 90, uh, we would fit into that column. So it tells us in that column to then take 250% of the full load current. So if we take 250% of 90 amps, we come up with a 225 amp fuse. And that's gonna be a time delay fuse. And uh, why? Because the transformer is just like a motor, isn't it? Coils of wire, and it's gonna have inrush current when I energize it. So I need to be able to account for that. I don't want to trip the or blow the fuses as soon as I turn the power on. So we use time delay protection then. Now, for the secondary current, I take my KVA, which is still going to be 75 times 1,000. And this time, my line-to-line -line voltage is going to be 208 volts, isn't it, rather than 480. So we multiply 208 volts times the square root of 3, and we divide that into the 75 KVA times 1,000, and we come up with 208 amps. Now, don't get confused. That's not the voltage, right? It just so happens that when we did this calculation, we came up with 208 amps, the same as the voltage level, but it's amperage here, 208. And so I look in my 405.3b table again, or excuse me, 450.3b table. And for uh, secondary protection, currents of nine amps or more, which this is definitely well over nine amps, it says take 125% of that full load current. 
So if I take 125% of 208 amps, I get 260 amp. So I need a 260 amp fuse on the secondary side. Uh, not gonna happen, is it? That's not a standard size. I'm probably not gonna be able to buy that fuse. So the notes at the bottom of the table. And remember, the notes at the bottom of the table are not informational notes. They're part of the code requirements. So the notes at the bottom of the table tell me that I, in this instance, I'm allowed to go up to the next higher standard size fuse rating, which if I were to look in uh, uh, 240.6, which gives me my standard size over current protection rating, I would find 300. So I could go up to a 300 amp fuse or if I wanted back down to a 250, but I could certainly put a 300 amp fuse in there, which is my next higher standard size. So now I know what? I know what I need for overcurrent protection on my transformer. Also, I have to make sure it's a requirement, it's a code requirement. I have to make sure that my equipment is, I install downstream, so in this case, it might be this panel board or whatever, uh, has the proper short circuit current rating. It has to at, at least meet or exceed the short circuit current that's available, what we call the available fault current out of this transformer. Also, I need to make sure that my interrupting rating on my overcurrent protective devices in, especially on that first one, does not exceed the available fault current now out of that transformer. So how do I do that? I know the full load currents, that information though for short circuit current ratings, available fault current was not on my nameplate. So what I have to do is I have to go to one more formula, right? And what we're going to do is it was required, remember the impedance was required to be on the transformer. And our nameplate said 4.56% impedance. So we need to find the, what we call the multiplier or M. And we're going to take 100 and divide it by the impedance. So if I take 100 and divide it by 4.56, I get an M value or a, uh, this multiplier of 22. So now I just simply take that 208 amps on the secondary because downstream of the secondary is where I'm worried about my short circuit current ratings. So I take that 208 amps on the secondary, multiply it by 22, and I come up with 4,560, or excuse me, 4,576 amps of available fault current. So any of my equipment downstream uh, I must have a short circuit current rating of at least that 45, 4,600 amps. And the interrupting rating on that first overcurrent protective device must also meet that requirement of the 4,600 amps. Now, in reality, we're certainly going to meet that, aren't we? We're going to have a minimum of 10,000 amps is what we're going to see for interrupting ratings, at least that I'm thinking that I could, would ever normally see. And certainly our equipment and the distribution system is going to exceed that. But we need to know that. We need to be able to determine that. We need to be able to answer those questions in the field as we install electrical equipment. Now, let's go ahead and wrap up and take a look at a few other items that are important to us in uh, Article 450. So auto transformers, if you get involved in installing auto transformers, they're covered in Article 450, Section 4, so 450.4. Now we use auto transformers. Uh, if you recall, an auto transformer just has one set of windings and then we can tap off at different points along those windings in order to get different voltages out of it. So we can read maybe from the top of the phase to my tap down here, wherever it is, <clears throat> excuse me, wherever it is, and I'll get whatever voltage. So where would we use something like that? But um, uh, let's say I have this distribution transformer we've been talking about and it puts out 208 volts on the secondary but I just bought some equipment that's rated for 240 volts. That's not uh, gonna fall within my 208 volt rating on the output of that transformer. So I need to get 240 volts to my new piece of equipment. So I can use an auto transformer to do that. So anyway, if you get installed involved in installing these auto transformers, make sure you take a look at 450.4. We've already covered the oil filled and liquid filled type transformers. I also want to mention 450, uh, Article 450, Part 3 as well, if you get in involved in transformer vaults. And if you think about it, I'm going to take this vault and I'm going to put 
a transformer on the inside of it, and it's going to be underground. So some of the important things certainly going to be the construction of the vault, uh, drainage of the vault. So if there is any water in there, I can get it out. Uh, I'm also concerned about the doors. I have to have proper egress out of that vault, don't I? And ventilation is going to be key as well. So all of those items are covered in part three of Article 450. So anyway, that's all the time we've got for today. We've had a lot of information uh, on transformers in Article 450 of the NEC. And I always like to wrap up with be sure and work safe when you're out there and so forth. But I'd also like to point out today, it made me think on transformers, the importance of nine, uh, Article uh, 90 in the NEC, where it talks about the purpose of the National Electrical Code. So not only do we have to go out there and work safely when we install and maintain this equipment, but remember, the whole purpose of installing this transformer is to protect people and property from the hazards arising from the use of electricity. So yeah, we put it in a distribution system to get the voltages we need, but we need to be able to protect John Q. Public out there as well and make sure that they, when they walk into a building, that transformer is properly installed and maintained so that we don't end up with any problems, issues, okay? So this uh, Tech Talk has been brought to you by ECNM Magazine once again, and they're part of the portfolio of Endeavor Business Publications, and do make sure you work safe and install and maintain your equipment safely out there. Until next time, I'm Randy Barnett.